Good afternoon and welcome to In-Home Care is Here to Stay, how Medicare Advantage is innovating to meet ben beneficiaries where they are. I'm Mary Beth Donahue, President and CEO of the Better Medicare Alliance, and we're honored to co-host today's webinar alongside Moving Health Home. I wanna start by thanking them for being such great partners in this event. You'll be hearing from today's panel moderator and founder of Moving Health Home, my good friend, Krista Drobak, um, in just a few short minutes. But first, I wanted to share some thoughts about our topic at hand today. As many of you know, more than 28 million seniors and individuals with disabilities, nearly half of the total Medicare population, choose the quality affordable coverage found in Medicare Advantage today. Research we've commissioned at the Better Medicare Alliance shows that these beneficiaries are reporting a 94% satisfaction rate, nearly 2,000 in annual cost savings and fewer avoidable hospitalizations, even as the program is delivering lower per beneficiary costs to the federal government. In recent years, we've also seen how Medicare Advantage has innovated to support care in the home leveraging its flexible benefit design and coordinated value-based framework to meet seniors where they are and keep them where they desire to be. As the daughter of 85 and 88-year-old parents, that is of personal importance to me, and I know many of you feel the same. Data from Milliman finds that for 2022, 99% of all Medicare Advantage plans are offering supplemental benefits that are not found in fee-for-service Medicare, including many benefits tailored to support in-home care. Consider that 544 plans now provide in-home support services, an 83% increase from just last year. And of that, 141 plans provide home-based palliative care. What's more, a full 95% of Medicare Advantage plans provide telehealth coverage, which proved invaluable in keeping seniors safe at home during the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Recognizing the impact that access to nutrition and transportation has on one's ability to live independently, 69% of Medicare Advantage plans now provide some form of meal benefit, while half cover transportation between medical appointments. And following 2018's enactment of the Chronic Care Act, which many of you helped to bring across the finish line, health plans are now able to provide personalized benefits tailored to meet the needs of the chronically ill. Milliman data also shows that 742,000 Medicare Advantage beneficiaries have access to social needs benefit package under what is known as the special supplemental benefits for the chronically ill. Likewise, 237,000 chronically ill beneficiaries are provided coverage for in-home repairs, and 175,000 beneficiaries have access to grocery shopping and door drop services. And I share all these facts because it's very important to understand that these are not simply perks or extras. For many older adults on Medicare Advantage, these at-home benefits are a lifeline enabling them to age in place, manage disease progression, and live with dignity and independence. And Medicare Advantage does not act alone to provide these supports. At Better Medicare Alliance, we work every day with aging service organizations, community-based not-for-profits that have forged meaningful partnerships with Medicare Advantage to uphold seniors' ability to receive care at home. And you're gonna hear from many of those organizations in just a few moments. As you listen to today's speakers, keep in mind that these benefits and opportunities in Medicare Advantage don't happen by accident. Medicare Advantage depends on continued support and stability from legislators and regulators to make this work possible. When policymakers stand up for Medicare Advantage, they stand up for the innovations in home-based care that their constituents rely on and that all seniors deserve. With that said, I wanna just thank you all again for joining us today. And just a reminder and housekeeping item that at the end we'll have Q&A time um, for this event. So please ask a question at any point using the Q&A function. So let's get ahead with the program and please let me turn to my friend and co-host Krista Drobak. And I wanna again, thank Krista and her team for their leadership in partnering with us on this event. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Mary Beth. So happy to be here. Thanks to all of you for coming. Moving Health Home grew out of the pandemic. We had been doing a lot of work on telehealth and remote patient monitoring, and that's not enough. It's not enough to just cover technology. It is important to have the care models that go along with the technology to truly give patients the option to get care at home. And we found out during the pandemic that patients like it, caregivers like it, practitioners like it, um, and it can be delivered safely in a high quality way. So we are dedicated to expanding more options to care in the home. But today we're gonna to talk about the market that's already happening and the innovation that's already happening. And that wouldn't be possible without Medicare Advantage. As you all know, fee for service uh, does not have a lot of flexibility. Um, moving Health Home, we are working towards um, more flexibility in the fee-for-service program, but right now the innovation is happening in Medicare Advantage, so we're, we're really pleased to have our members here today and all of you here today to understand the current market and what's possible in innovation. So the first thing we're going to do is find out the landscape uh, that exists today. Um, <coughs> So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Tyler Cromer from ATI Advisory, who's done some work on what's already happening, and that will lay the groundwork for our panel discussion. Take it away, Tyler. Great. Thank you so much, Krista and Mary Beth, for um, those intros and for hosting this event today. I'm delighted to be with all of you, and I am just going to share my screen. Great. So my job in the next 10 minutes is to give you all an overview of the current landscape of Medicare Advantage in home care benefits. Just briefly, um, I work at ATI Advisory, which is a research and advisory services firm in Washington, DC, working across sectors to bring better care to the frail elderly population and to the complex care population. We have been conducting a lot of research on Medicare Advantage supplemental benefits over the last three years. So I'm just delighted to be able to talk to you all about that today and give everyone a good overview before we dive into what's going to be a really wonderful panel with great experts um, on the line. So uh, just a little bit of framing here, which Mary Beth did beautifully. Uh, we're seeing three things that have really pushed care into the home um, in the last couple of years, and particularly particularly in Medicare Advantage. So number one, and most of the folks on the line probably know this um, from experience, and, um, and it's that Medicare beneficiaries want to age in place. Um, and most people want to stay in their home, but we also know that about half of individuals over age 65 are going to need a high level of care at some point, and three quarters of those people live at home. So there's a desire to live at home, and there's a need for support to stay at home. Um, secondly, um, as Chris Krista highlighted, the pandemic really brought more medical care into the home in Medicare, even in traditional Medicare fee-for-service, um, where essentially um, telehealth was non-existent prior to the pandemic. We saw this massive shift to people wanting and needing to receive care in their home, and I think that's opened up some potential policy levers. And then thirdly, at the same time, and sort of just by happenstance, both Congress and the last administration took action to allow Medicare Advantage plans to deliver a broader variety of supplemental benefits. Um, some of those are in the home, and we've seen actually most of them are being delivered in the home, especially through the pandemic. But these are benefits that Medicare Advantage can bring to Medicare beneficiaries that are not in that base package of benefits that they would receive in traditional Medicare fee-for-service. And this is what we're going to spend a lot of our time talking about today. Okay, so it's Medicare. And so when we talk about the authorities that Medicare Advantage plans have to bring um, in-home support services um, or personal care um, to beneficiaries, it's of course a complicated web of authorities. And that's why this slide has so many words on it. Uh, but what we see um, that we're gonna sort of focus on most are these expanded primarily health-related benefits. So um, in the, the prior administration, administratively 
changed the definition of what it meant to be primarily health related. That meant that for the first time in 2019, uh, personal care or in-home support services could be offered as a supplemental benefit. And um, we really did not see that occurring prior to 2019. Around the same time, the Chronic Care Act passed and Congress expanded authority for non-medical benefits through special supplemental benefits for the chronically ill. And these are benefits that are really specifically tailored to individuals who have complex chronic conditions. Um, those are the sort of the authorities that are sort of most important for you to understand for this discussion. But I wanted to just mention briefly that there are a couple of other flexibilities available to Medicare Advantage plans in the gray, um, uniformity flexibility. So plans are able to offer these supplemental benefits, you know, things that traditionally were vision, dental, and hearing and still are, uh, but are now expanded into a broader variety of things that can be delivered in the home. There are able to tailor those benefits to um, disease state. That's what that change allowed um, so that they can have a, a targeted benefit for individuals with, say, diabetes. Um, and then there's also a demonstration going on out of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation called the Value-Based Insurance Design Demonstration. Just want you to be aware of that uh, because it's another way that plans could be offering supplemental benefits. Um, it is also um, testing right now off offering hospice benefits in Medicare Advantage. So just want folks on the line to be aware of these flexibilities. I also want you to know uh, that well, you know, these additional flexibilities, while they have allowed for a lot of innovation and we're seeing some really interesting and exciting things in the market, um, they did not provide additional resources. So these benefits are all offered within um, the fully capitated Medicare Advantage payment. So what are these benefits? Um, this table is going to highlight new benefits that are available um, via special supplemental benefits for the chronically ill or SSBCI or that were allowable once the administration changed that definition of primarily health related benefits. Um, we've seen growth across the board over the last three years in these benefits. So we see more plans every year offering these benefits. Um, and I want to highlight the bold items here, which we're going to spend a little more time on. In-home support services, um, you can see growing over time from 223 plans offering a benefit in 2020 up to 729 in 2022, and then also home-based palliative care. Um, In-home support services is one of the most popular benefits being offered um, under these new authorities. So this slide is going to show you if you look at if you look at only um, in-home support services offered as a primarily health related benefit, you're not seeing the full picture. Um, when we add in sort of all of those authorities that we talked about a couple of slides ago, we see that in-home support services are actually in 2022 offered by almost a thousand plans. Uh, this is 18% of all Medicare Advantage plans, um, with some exclusions, happy to talk through how we define that, um, or almost one out of every five plans. So you, you, what you see here is that you know in 2018, there were no plans offering in-home support services. And in 2022, we see one in five uh, offering these benefits. So it's really substantial growth. Um, and again, I think this is driven by um, a few things. One, uh, people's desire to age in place and to receive services at home. Um, and that these are, these are benefits that people can understand and want. So this slide is just going to give you a lot of facts about in-home support services as a supplemental benefit in Medicare Advantage. So first, what are they? And this is the CMS definition in the upper left-hand corner. Um, you're going to see that this is help with ADLs or IADLs provided by an individual that's licensed by the state to provide personal care services. 
Um, there are, again, 952 plans offering this benefit in 2022. And in the um, bottom left-hand corner, you can see where these benefits are available. So if a county is shaded blue, that means that at least one Medicare Advantage plan offers in-home support services as a benefit. And you can see here that while geographic availability is not uh, perfect. We don't see the whole country covered. It is um, available in uh, quite a large part geographically of the country and also um, where many of our population centers are. And then on the right hand side, you're just going to see the organizations who are offering in-home supports in the most number of plans. You're going to see the same thing here for home-based palliative care. Um, again, the map, um, however, the map looks quite different. You can see that these benefits are not broadly available by geography. And then I just wanted to tell you what these benefits look like. Um, this is not Medicaid. Um, so you're not going to see the sort of um, coverage that you might see in Medicaid. You're going to see um, really um, a much smaller number of hours. Remember, there are no additional resources here, um, but they can still be really significant when you think about a person's life and what they need uh, potentially to stay safe in their home. Um, and what I really want to point out here is you know, if these pies were to scale, the one on the right-hand side showing um, 2021 benefits would be almost, would be double the size of the one on the left. So the number of plans offering are growing and the generosity grew significantly from 2020 to 2021. So this is all uh, manual research. We went through um, these hundreds of um, plan documents um, to be able to tell you um, that we see more generous benefits. So in this slide, the gray is more generous. So you can see the gray piece of the pie getting bigger. The blue benefits are fewer hours and we see that piece of the pie getting smaller. One more trend I wanted to make folks aware of that we're seeing and that I think will continue is that plans are offering benefit packages to really meet members where they are. And so we're seeing a lot of flexible benefit design. So where a plan is offering up to $1,000 for a variety of benefits that a member selects in partnership with a plan care coordinator or a digital wallet where a beneficiary receives a, num a certain number of credits that can be spent on different services. This can sometimes be a menu of options or uh, essentially like a debit card. Um, and we're just seeing this be um, as a very uh, sort of more common, and I think very powerful way to deliver benefits to members. And we're seeing a lot of maturing of the marketplace. So uh, we see plans take two basic approaches to building a network to deliver these benefits. They either develop it themselves um, or they work with a third party aggregator to develop and administer the network. Um, but we're just seeing, I think, a lot of growth and maturity, which um, we're going to have a great panel to talk about in more detail. Um, we do see, again, this probably won't be a surprise to anyone on the phone, but fulfillment and staffing are real pain points right now. Um, I'm sure that will come up in, um, in the next discussion as well. So thanks so much. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Krista. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, Jonathan, we're getting questions about whether the deck can be shared. Um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, I know we'll want to check with the ATI, with Tyler and ATI advisory, but um, on BMA's end, we're, um, we're happy to share that out if we get that, uh, if we get that approval. Terrific. Terrific. So now we're going to talk about some real on the ground examples and experiences that people are having in Medicare Advantage working with patients in the home. Um, I'm just going to say the names um, and organizations of our panelists today. They all have incredible backgrounds, and we're going to put their LinkedIn uh, pages in the chat so you can read more about their background. But we really want to take up today's time uh, learning about their experiences with Medicare Advantage. We have Dr. Damian Doyle, who is the Vice President of Medical Affairs um, for the Home and Community-Based Services at Signify Health. We have Vicki Hauk, the CEO of the Home Care Association of America. Chad Bra, who's the Vice President of Healthcare Transformation at Home Instead. And Shelly Sun, who is the CEO and founder of Bright Star Care. Uh, so we're gonna um, go around the room on various different questions and then open it up for audience Q&A. Um, so I really wanna start with um, a question about the innovation that's happening in MA. 
uh, related to in-home care. There's a lot of partnerships happening. And uh, Dr. Doyle, I was wondering if you could tell us about how Signify is partnering um, with uh, MA plans to deliver in-home care and, and actually how those models are designed. Yeah, sure. Thank you. And happy to be here and happy to be an ally of both Moving Health Home and the Better Medicare Alliance. And always happy to, to chat with you all. So home is clearly the preferred site of care that we've been talking about for most of the population we serve. Just a minor anecdote, I have a family member who is an incredibly independent, high-functioning 83-year-old male. He had a relatively mild case of COVID. He fell, he broke his hip, and he required a hip replacement. Surgery went well, but he continued to test positive for COVID for 20 days. And so, you know, the, the protocols in place were hip, re, hip fall equals hip fracture equals surgery equals subacute rehab. And the subacute rehabs that would take him at COVID positive, as he said, if you want me to be in your club, I don't want to join that club, right? So, so the reality is he finally got home. It was a difficult journey and we finally got him home with home health services, but it's, it's clear that the current protocols, at least in the acute care settings, don't necessarily mesh what, what the desires and the wishes of the patient population that we serve are. And again, those protocols are fairly rote and they just directly push you into settings that you nor your wallet don't necessarily want to be at. We at Signify provide about 2 million in-home evaluations for the MA population, as well as some ACA, ACO, and Medicaid populations. During the pandemic, we as all providers pivoted to virtual and remote visits, and those are certainly helpful and will remain a significant portion of our portfolio. But clearly being in the home, seeing the beneficiaries where they live and getting a better understanding of the challenges that they face in the real world is invaluable. During those in-home visits, we're able to, to discern the unique challenges that a beneficiary is encountering. Our partners, primarily MA plans and health systems, use this information to better tailor their services to the member themselves. For instance, if we determine that medication is an issue, what we used to term non-compliance, but now better understand is non-adherence or unable to take the medication for a multitude of reasons, the health plan along with the PCP and care team can look at simple solutions such as shifting to mail order for th three month supplies or uh, to avoid having to go to the pharmacy or as well as, letting, as well as letting the PCP team know that the member is not taking the medication because it's intolerable. So again, medications are a fairly obvious issue, but the concerns that are identified span the gamut. A lot of these needs are more specific to activities of daily living or instrumental activities of daily living and issues regarding overall home health, both acute and chronic. And I'd be very interested to hear from the rest of the panelists about while sometimes somewhat mundane needs, these are critical needs that allow people to stay in the home, to live the best lives possible and to tailor those, those beneficiaries benefits to the beneficiaries themselves. A lot of, of what, um, what our first Tyler spoke about today, about how those are evolving and moving forward. I was at two different health plans in, in my previous career. And as we thought about the bid and we structured these, we were hindered oftentimes before some of the new innovations came to the forefront to say, can we adapt to the specific needs rather than using a broad brush to paint everyone with the same, the same color? So that's kind of the, the start off, um, how we assess, how we evaluate, how we then inform not only the health plan, but also the primary care team to make sure that the individual needs of that individual person are addressed and met. Health Home, we do surveys to show that Americans want to be in their homes and caregivers want to be in their homes. But I think like Damien, we probably all know people who you can just ask, hey, would you rather be in a hospital or rather be at home? My own parents both got COVID. They are in their 80s. Uh, two weeks ago, and my mother refused to go to the hospital, and my father went to the hospital and left my mother alone, and she dropped her pills, couldn't pick them up, didn't take them for three days while he was gone. So it's just this like ripple effect that happens um, if people don't have an option um, to get in-home care. So thanks for the personal story to Dr. Doyle. That's really helpful to put, put this in perspective. Um, Shelly, I'd like to turn to you about how you approach MA plans and the value proposition that you share with them. Because we know that in-home care can reduce costs, as we've already talked about, it is preferred. Um, so what, what do you tell them when you, when you are convincing them that in-home care is an important benefit? Yeah, thanks, Krista. And uh, similarly, I'm really glad to be aligned with um, Moving Health Home and to be um, participating in a very important topic. Um, we have a, a large national account program. So many of the plans that are administering over the Medicare Advantage um, program, we already had national account 
relationship with, and then we expanded into looking at Medicare Advantage. Uh, the rates are, you know, unsustainable from the very beginning. They're low, and so we believed we needed to have data to show how home care can really reduce the overall cost of care. So uh, we are fortunate to have our own technology and our own data. We have since I founded the business in 2002, still own 100% of it. So happy to be able to invest in technology and data from 2004, all of our technology and all of our data has been on the same platform. So we uh, entered into a relationship with Avalier Health uh, to be able to use their access to Medicare um, Part A and B claims data up against our population to demonstrate that we were really making a significant impact in reducing the overall cost of care with the utilization of home care. We believe we did some things unique. We have a registered nurse involved in a plan of care that's also involved in the supervision of care. We're voluntarily joint commission accredited and follow all the policies and procedures across the brand. Those things cost money. And so what we found is we were getting the same rate as every other brand providing home care. We had to be able to tell the story backed up by data as to how we improve results. Avalier published a study, it's their study. We did. We had to turn over our data, they ran it, it's, it's published by them. Across 30 unique health conditions, we um, had up to a $30,000 of savings um, and an average of $13,000 of savings. On our congestive heart failure um, population, we had $7 million of savings compared to the control group. So we have uh, um, clinical pathways for certain more um, a common um, uh, incidents of, of care and, and who were taken care of from a population standpoint, standpoint. We knew we had to be able to tell the story. Um, we believe wholeheartedly in Medicare Advantage. We I guess, started this business to take care of our moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas. Medicare Advantage is a big part of that and a growing part of that. How do we do that in a sustainable way? We're having to get in network, not make money that's sustainable to cover those oversight pro programs, but we've very, been very successful in being able to have our Men Medicare Advantage plan see our quality compared to others and our outcomes compared to others and use our Avalier data to get that conversation started and have been able to get 30 plus percent rate increases as we've had some of the plans be able to see our data compared to others that might be taking care of them because quality ma matters and everything that we can do to avoid a admission or readmission, a fall, um, a utilization of home health or skilled um, nursing facility or emergency room is very beneficial holistically to the quality of life of those that we take care of, but also to the um, healthcare um, cost uh, that our whole country is trying to absorb. Shelly, it's definitely as important to have data as it is to have these important anecdotes. Um, we have dropped uh, Shelly's study into the chat. Uh, Moving Health Home also did an Avalier study, so we're going to drop that in the chat as well. Uh, maybe, Jonathan, we could have a landing page or something where people can reference all of these different studies. But before I move on to v Vicki and Chad, all four of you, if you have other data that you want to talk about right now, I think this would be a good time to do that because evidence and data is absolutely essential when um, we're thinking about, you know, we, members, member experience is obviously very important, but when you're getting down to the dollars and cents, um, evidence is really important. So I just want to open up to the um, other three panelists to talk about data that they may have available, and we can, again, make that accessible to the um, people who are watching this webinar. Damien, does Signify have formal um, studies? I'm sure, Vicki, you must have formal studies as well. Chad, I saw you on mute. Does Home Instead have some formal um, evidence? Yeah, uh, we, you know, I could, I could drop this in the chat or put this um, out post presentation, but we've done some partnerships with providers specifically to heart failure and chronic diseases in terms of readmission rates and, and um, medication compliance with that particular cohort of patients uh, to show improvements in the quality of care and the follow-up care particularly, um, partnering with providers uh, on the acute care side uh, to be able to get into the home and to see how um, we can support these patients in managing the uh, congestive heart failure condition. And I'll try to add that to the chat so we can share that data as well. Okay. Um, and we um, have, 
Sorry, Joe, we have we have some additional information as well as the impact in, in terms of the post visit, uh, in terms of the impact on the overall medical loss ratio and overall performance of the patients, including gain back in to see their primary care teams. So I can get you that information as well. And Moving Health Home, we have a research on our website as well, movinghealthhome.org. So for any of you who ever encounter anyone who says there is not enough evidence uh, on in-home care, it's not true. There is published evidence. There is evidence from specific providers. Um, so this is one of the things that we deal with uh, on the, on the you know, congressional side with folks saying, hey, we, you know, we're, we're going to change the laws. We need the evidence that this isn't going to you know, blow the Medicare budget or, uh, or that it's, you know, it's actually going to um, improve the efficiency of the program. So in that vein, uh, we should talk about some of the barriers to broader adoption of care in the home in the MA market specifically. Um, Vicki, do you have thoughts on how to address some of those barriers either through, they could be policy barriers or operational barriers. We want to hear about both. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. It's nice to join everyone on this call. This is a really important topic, so we're happy that we can be part of it. You know, in our association, as you know, we exclusively represent home care providers that are providing personal care, and we're finding that a lot of them are starting to provide skilled care. And I think one of the barriers that we continue to face, and I think Shelley answered that barrier and is dealing with that barrier when it comes to data. When the CMS announced that there was going to be this new supplemental service that MA plans are going to be able to um, offer, I have to tell you, being a, a, a state lobbyist for 20 years and being in this field, I was ready to celebrate with at least two glasses of wine that night because I thought never in my lifetime would I see Medicare paying for home care. And Krista, you talked with me yesterday about this big misperception and it's still out there that people think that Medicare covers in-home support services. So one of the barriers I think that our agencies are experiencing, and I think Brightstar is a leader in this, is having the data that MA plans need in order to say, yeah, this isn't a good investment. I think it's fair to say that there has been a huge um, learning curve for both sides. I think MA plans had no idea who we were. I think our sector of home-based care, and I'm using that in the terms of we've got home health doing Medicare skilled, and then we've got end-of-life care hospice, but our care is we have a bit of an identity crisis, and we're dealing with this, with this because we have no national standard right now for in-home support care. We have state licenses, and let's be real clear, only 30 states license in-home support care. So right there, you know, MA plans go to, you know, what are your standards of care? Talk to us about it. And the fact that we have to pause for a minute and say, okay, you're in Illinois. This is what we're permitted to do. You're in California. And so that in itself becomes a barrier. And I think that MA plans know that this is a popular service. They want to provide it. But I think when this all started a few years ago, one of my friends calls it the silent earthquake. And he likens it to um, when Medicaid years ago, you know, most all Medicaid budgets dealt with nursing homes. In fact, I remember reading the budget line item and it said long-term care, synonymous nursing home care. Hardly any money spent on home-based care. Now you fast forward to 2022 and you know, wow, it's like 60, 70% of Medicaid budgets now are to home and community-based services. So I think this is going to have that same, a little bit of, of delay and really going full hog on this. And I always encourage our members to, we've got to give data and we've got to prove just what Shelly did already, that four hours of personal care in the home, supervising medications and, and watching people so they don't fall can indeed result in this amount of cost savings, whether it's hospitalizations, ER, whatever, because we intuitively, you know what, Krista, you're right. We know that this, this works. We know that it's cost effective. But let's face it, in today's healthcare world, it's all about data. And so I think another um, area that we have to recognize is our workforce problem as another barrier. Um, we did a survey a few months back and we saw, you know, 80% of our members turning away clients because they didn't have workers to staff the case. 
So when you add another whole payer source and another service line, you're going to have that problem. And I think we've got to address that. I think it's starting to loosen up a bit, but I think Shelly mentioned the sustainability of these rates. We must now pay our workers more and I think they deserve it. There's no question there. And we also are seeing state minimum wages going up. So in order to keep our services you know, affordable, that's another barrier to this. I think the learning curve too on the side of our providers is that most of our folks are not used to dealing with insurances. And so they're learning about payment and billing and all those kinds of things. But I've got to conclude this by on a positive that this learning curve is starting to level off. And I think we have the opportunity to educate, to talk about the many variety of services. And we're not just talking about support service, medication compliance, help with activities of daily living. We're talking about transportation. We're talking about companionship. So um, I think we're on the upswing. So I, I look forward to a bright future on this. Thank you. Thanks, Vicki. Those are two very important barriers. Well, three, but it sounds like the third one's getting addressed. <laughs> Um, Chad, what kind of barriers are you encountering in expanding and scaling um, your capabilities? Yeah, thank you, Krista. And uh, as others have said, it's an honor to be here today. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to work with both the Better America, Medicare Alliance and support the work of Moving Health Home. Um, you know, representing Home Instead, we have existed for uh, roughly 30 years in home care. And, and we do also have the unique perspective of um, delivering home care across the globe. So we can see how it is funded in other countries. And, you know, there are countries such as Germany uh, and Ireland that it's entirely government funded. Um, our, our business is entirely working with plans there that fund the care that we provide in those countries. Our vision has always been how we expand the world's capacity to care. And, and we do this both on the, on the funding side and, and also in how we can move more and more services into the home where uh, people desire uh, to, to, to live. Um, and so I, I guess I would just, there was a few points that Vicki has already made, but I think what I just really wanted to focus on was how we unlock this value that Shelly shared in her comments. Um, when, when I was told about this panel, I looked at it as a way that, that both the providers and the plans could come together to better understand one another and what the business constraints are on both sides of it. For us at home instead, um, you know, because of our vision of expanding the world's capacity to care, I think like everyone on this call, we've been really encouraged by the growth of Medicare Advantage. And when uh, it was determined that in-home support services would be included in that a few years ago, we saw this as a, a great opportunity to care for more people. The truth of the matter is, I think it is, it's just been difficult to navigate both as a provider and sometimes as an enrollee. Uh, we would go into the market and there might be 20,000 enrollees in that market that would result in maybe three referrals to an office. And so kind of building upon what Vicki said, um, when our, our providers, when our offices go through the process of enrolling and being a part of a, a Medicare Advantage plan as a provider, um, it's sometimes a little frustrating to them to, to kind of see what that results in in terms of the actual utilization of the service. And I think that's primarily due to some of the qualifying conditions and authorizations required to actually use the benefit. And I think one of the unique positions about home care and, and all of the healthcare ecosystem is maybe more than any other healthcare segment, we've traditionally been more consumer driven. And so how we could work with the plans, knowing what we know over the years, really having to take a service that, that focuses more on consumer behavior than maybe any other part of healthcare. And how can we do that in such a way that, that more people get the value that Shelly talked about and, and improve the, the, the way these benefits are structured and how people access them. I'm really encouraged to see what Tyler presented in terms of digital wallets coming about. I think that could be a huge way to to help seniors particularly navigate these benefits um, and, and how we could work more closely with these third-party payers in doing so. Because the fact of the matter is in, in many parts of, of home care, um, we don't work mostly with third-party payers. You know, We're working directly with families and 
um, and, and providing care there. And so, as Vicki said, we have to educate ourselves and what the payers want and how we work with them. And I think we've, we've begun to um, move that on the learning curve. But also, it's my hope that we can also educate some of the plans in such a way that they know how to work with us and how to navigate the home care industry so we can unlock all this value. One of the things that's happened over the last decade is that we've realized that cl clinical care is only a very you know, small part of health and overall well-being. And now we're seeing plans um, invest in uh, social isolation, combating social isolation in um, food, housing, um, transportation, you know, all of these social determinants. And sometimes these are separate benefits that are being contracted for, uh, in, um, you know, for supplemental benefits. But I've got to believe that if a, a care provider is going into the home to do in-home care as part of a, um, you know, follow-up visit to a, um, an acute visit, you can see the social situation. You can see, you know, the cupboards are empty or the medication is up on a shelf that's too high, or, you know, you see all those things that you don't see in a provider office. Um, so I just want to open up to all four of you, you know, there's got to be a way to also couple in-home care with solutions around social determinants and social isolation. And I heard you, Vicki, say companionship, but I would love to expand on that before we um, open it up for audience questions. Yeah, I think that's one of the most unique things about home care is that I, I felt like a, a doctor spends seven minutes with the client. Our home care aides spend hours with the client. They become part of the family. And when my mother lived with me for four years and I had a home care aide in my home, that person became my next, I had three sisters and then I had four, right? And I think you're right, Krista, when you say, we're just not talking about home care, but you're right. We recognize that family is not nearby. So who's doing the grocery shopping? Who is helping with the check? So that's, that's the other thing about being innovative as home care agencies. And many of our agencies are very innovative when it comes to social determinants of health because they recognize when they start that assessment as Dr. Doyle talked about, that assessment is so important when you first go in there. What's the home like? What is the home really good for someone who is in a wheelchair? Do we need to have some equipment to help that aid so the aid doesn't get hurt, nor does the client get hurt? So I think it, that's what makes, I think, this whole thing great when it comes to offering home care, because home care is not just a very specific care, but it it wraps the care and support around the client and provides them with whatever they need. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add that. So our, our assessments are about 45 to 60 minutes long. And when we send the physicians and PSPs into the home, they do a very thorough evaluation and determine things like fall risk, like uh, the re empty refrigerator sign, uh, like doing the PHQ-4 and PHQ-9 to look for, uh, for uh, depression, anxiety, suicidality risk, all those types of things. And all of our plants across the board are asking us to do more and more in the home, whether it's diagnostic preventative point of care testing, like hemoglobin A1Cs for diabetics, or whether it's when we make a, a, a diagnosis or when we inform the plant of a diagnosis. If we say patient Smith has dementia, then what are we going to do about that dementia? How do we then partner with people on this panel and other services to say, what are the care supports that we can put in place to keep that member, that beneficiary in their home, living the best life they can and not ending up in institutionalized care. I, I still see patients, I'm a geriatrician, I see them in institutionalized care. That is a different world. It's a world that transform, was transforming before the pandemic. The pandemic radically transformed it. And very, very few people, including almost, I bet no one on this panel wants to end up in a long-term care setting. Now, sometimes you have to. Sometimes there are things that happen and they just simply cannot stay at home. But to whatever degree we can to enable that and allow that, uh, that's where, where we're at. And I'll tell you, all of our health plans and, and basically all the health plans, our clients, they, they are all saying, what more can we do? What more can we services can we drive home? Whether it be simple testing so they don't have to go to a physician's office or whether it be put social supports in, in place and partner with Bright Star or Home Care and those types of organizations to do that. Yeah, I, I, what led me to this role is I worked on the acute care side for 25 years and just saw the limitations of the delivery of episodic care to chronic conditions. And um, 
there was a particular patient in the or, that we treated in the organization I was at uh, who had um, she had 100 emergency department visits in a single year until she got into our accountable care organization. And uh, we had three EDs across the city. Um, when we started linking things together and realizing how often she was in our emergency departments, we, through our, our accountable care organization, we sent a, a caregiver out to her home, realized she was a diabetic patient. She didn't have a working refrigerator and she didn't have a wheelchair ramp and she was wheelchair bound. And so every three days, she would have an acute condition that required an ED visit and in working with uh, in a different way where caregivers were going into her home, we were able to get a working refrigerator and build a wheelchair ramp. And she went six months without another ED visit. And so it's, it's stories like that that I think could really help us unlock uh, what is really going on in, in patients' lives in the homes. And, and I think our, our care pros are exactly the eyes and ears we need in the delivery of this uh, that could could change the way um, healthcare is delivered in our country. And, and, and you know, the way it's set up, these those acute care settings, they all probably knew of that woman, but they didn't have the, right. the 50,000 foot view that a Medicare Advantage plan would have to say, she's not just going to St. Luke, she's going to St. Joe's and St. Mike's, and she's going to all of them because these are her needs and they're just needs that aren't being met and addressed. And that's where MA can step in and say, we can see the whole picture. That's right. Let's put some things into place to, to, to stop that trajectory. And what, oh, sorry, Krista. Yeah, what, and what also are the opportunities in the future for value-based purchasing you know, arrangements where you're rewarded based upon improving the outcomes? And does that mm -hmm. allow the boundaries of what home care kind of supplemental benefit does can grow and expand? Also a allowing for kind of joint commission versus Medicare accreditation. You know, we've been doing nursing led care since the very beginning. You know, we're probably about 3,000 nurses working on any given day, 23,000 home health aides or certified nursing assistants. So we have nurses in the home and they are able to, you know, identify more things and take a care management holistic view, know if there's a medication change that needs to be coordinated with a physician, et cetera. And that's going to be less expensive, you know, than a there's a lot of times where an MP or a doctor is going to be necessary, but how can a nurse be part of that equation? And right now, because of Medicare certification, our boundary kind of stops at the supplemental. And I think we have to get to where if the plan is administering it, do they have an ability to use non-Medicare accredited because we're not billing CMS? Doesn't mean that we're not operating the same quality and the same standards under joint commission uh, guidance. And I think that's a real innovation for the future. We're trying to lean into some of those by doing some of those services and demonstration projects right now um, with plans and with hospital at home, et cetera, and, and, and blurring those lines with them being the one to bill um, Medicare. But I'm buying up a lot of my, my franchisees to have more areas where I could lean in and risk my balance sheet. Most franchisees don't have the ability to wait for a quality or outcome-based incentive. They need the money up front because they're making payroll every month. And so I have an ability to take some of that risk, which I'm doing because I think we have an ability to prove out this model. And then eventually some franchisees will want to participate in that. But I think we have to get to enough scale to say, you know, why cut us out of value-based purchasing? We can be part of the incentive base. We believe in our quality. We believe in what we can do. And my hope is that's where some of this future is headed. I, I could not agree more. Value-based care is, home care is a completely obvious service when you're talking about value-based arrangements. It's just obvious. But, and Damien, to your point, those institutions don't have an incentive or a workflow that would allow them to, to address the needs of that senior. Um, that's why these value-based care arrangements do create the, the sort of holistic incentive for all the players involved. And it's one of the things that we are working on through Moving Health Home on the policy front. Yeah, um, sometimes Jonathan. their incentives are perverse actually to the, to the opposite, unfortunately. Exactly, so, yeah. exactly. Um, Jonathan, uh, we have a few questions from the audience, I understand. Uh, yes, yes, we do. Thanks, Krista. Uh, the first question comes from Evelyn, uh, and she says, what do you feel innovators must keep top of mind to support aging in the home for Medicare Advantage members, specifically when focusing on uh, mobility and strength building and fall support slash prevention? 
Hey, do you want to take that one? What are the kinds of innovations that we're thinking about, um, like important innovations and and specific to fall risks? I know that Medicare Advantage, um, when CMS redefined what primarily health related it was, they said that you could put bars in your home. And, and it was funny because at the time I did, wasn't really that familiar with senior falls. And so I thought bars, I mean, Medicare Advantage is going to start paying for bars in the home, but it's actually extremely important. Um, so I thought that was a really you know good innovation by, uh, by Medicare Advantage. But now that we have stretched the, um, the definition of primarily health related, there are a bunch of different things that can be done. Um, so what are some of the innovations that you think could uh, move us forward on that front. I'm sorry, Krista, did you ask me? Oh, okay. Um, well, getting back to your comment about the bars, and yeah, unfortunately, it's not the bars that you're thinking about, Krista, but I think the other thing that we're starting to see and that some of our policy discussions are centering around is making homes livable in order for people to stay and, and at home. In fact, um, there is a lot of work being done. There's legislation now that's in Congress that would allow people to spend their 401k savings early without penalty to use to modify their homes if they desire to stay there. And I think that in itself is, is something that we've got to look at because it is a barrier to staying at home. We've got to look at the homes out there. We know that the older homes in this country do not have those bathrooms on the first floor. Um, that they're very small for wheelchairs. So that's one thing. I think we're also starting to see other kinds of innovations in regard to specialty service lines. I think our agencies are looking at the, you know, the top diagnosis of, of our Medicare beneficiaries and they're seeing that dementia is huge. So I'm starting to see a lot of our um, providers doing specialty services, adding a certification for their aides to get in dementia care. And I think MA plans are looking at that as a plus. So I, I think that's one thing. Um, and then I, I think the other thing is just looking at how can we retain that workforce? One of the things that we're starting to see, I talked with one plan about a month ago, they're looking at as far as criteria for who they're gonna contract with. They're, they're, they're thinking that turnover data is important, which kind of sends shutters to all of us in the field, I know, but when you think about quality of care, that continuous caregiver is important, that, that relationship that is built. So what can we do to you know, elevate the profession of caregiving? And I think that we have an alliance that is now um, just starting work with the National Association for Home Care to actually address the workforce issue. What can we do to elevate the profession of caregiving? What can we do to um, make sure that we have a culture of caring which is kind of new when we did our survey on workforce, that, that, at that, that issue, a culture of caring became one of the top reasons why people come to work for certain agencies. So how do we do that? What do we, what do we promote? And I, so I think those things are just, just a few things that we're looking at as far as innovation for care and making sure that we have the caregivers to deliver that care. Yeah, when I think of a home-based caregiver, I certainly don't think of someone that's dialing it in. I mean, it's not an easy job and it's, not it requires a person who is a caring person, so. Um, and it's not like the shortage of retail and hospitality and restaurants. I always say, please don't compare us to that group because this workforce is special. They've got to have that extra thing, that empathy yeah. that, that isn't found in all different other types of workforce. Jonathan, we have time for one more question, I think. Uh, we've got a question from Joe who asks, can you expand on plans investing in diminishing social isolation? Which plans, what model T's are relied on to decrease isolation? What's the evidence of efficacy on what terms and how does the beneficiary take advantage of the opportunity? So I'm the one that mentioned it. So I will say there was a study maybe five or six years ago that said that social isolation was the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day, um, that it had that big of an impact on your body. And um, at that point, I wanna say I want to say it was Anthem originally that started investing in it, but I'm not sure. Um, 
I don't know if others on the call are familiar with this, but I'm assuming we could probably find you a report or two about, um, maybe Tyler might know, I don't know, but I don't know the specifics. I just know that there was a, a growing trend to address social isolation because of the clinical impact that it has on your health. Um, if you are diabetic and socially isolated, you have um, higher A1Cs um, and loneliness causes more depression and depression is, um, is a comorbidity that worsens basically all chronic diseases. Uh, so it, it, it has become more of a priority, but. Um, you know, I noticed too from Tyler's data, if you're still on Tyler, that one of the things that actually diminished was the accessibility to home, I'm sorry, to day programs. I don't know if that was a pandemic fallout or, or what that issue was, but um, you know, day programs can be really helpful actually for social isolation issues. But I saw that in your data um, they actually went down. That's, that's right. And we do think that's largely because of the pandemic and um, one or two major carriers dr dropping the benefit as a result. And I couldn't agree with you more that it can be a really important way to address social isolation. Um, and so you can see, and, and I'm, I'll, I'm try, I'll try to put it to the chat. We have a chart book on our website that's totally free and you can see um, where the benefits are available and what carriers are offering them. So I'll make sure that that's sent out to everybody. So you have that resource as well. Jonathan and Jeremiah, I hate to put both of you on the spot, but maybe we could put a landing page on the BMA website and on the Moving Health Home websites where people can go to get all of these resources, because I'm seeing that Jonathan is saying that there are questions about research, and I know that BMA has the Milliman study and as well as others, and Jeremiah put our Avalier study and our morning consult study, and then Shelly's study, um, Chad's um, evidence, there's a, there's a bunch of different resources I think that we could put together coming out of this webinar. Um, so maybe we could create a couple landing pages um, and send those around. It's my favorite thing to do, create work for people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanna, we have three minutes. Is there a question, Jonathan, that you think we can answer in three minutes? Otherwise I'll just, um, have Mary Beth and I need just do some wrap up. Um, maybe we can close with this question uh, from, from Grace. Uh, she says, do you foresee any restrictions or regulations on in-home or telehealth uh, risk assessments post public health emergency or annual wellness visits? So I'll just quickly, so on the annual wellness visits, the annual wellness visits were on the pre-pandemic list of approved services under Part B for telehealth use. The challenge is that if the telehealth flexibilities expire, those, um, those assessments would only be able to be done in rural areas and the patient would actually have to be in an institutional setting. They couldn't be at home. So it's almost sort of useless. Um, the, uh, the telehealth flexibilities are extended for 151 days after the pan after the public health emergency expires, and our hope is that if we can um, basically combat the perceptions that telehealth costs money or increases fraud, that we will be successful in getting long-term coverage for telehealth. Um, and remote monitoring is already a benefit, so you can certainly monitor the biometric data of your patients remotely. Um, and then, but again, as I mentioned up the top, telehealth and remote monitoring are only the tools. We need the care models. And Medicare Advantage is truly the, the you know, the next frontier, testing all the next frontier that, you know, we hope to one day have in people service, but really Medicare Advantage is leading the way on the kinds of care models that um, can can wrap around the telehealth and remote monitoring services. So um, I'm so pleased to have been here today to be partnering with the lead organization on Medicare Advantage because again, we love innovation and it's coming out of, out of your members, Mary Beth. So I'll turn it over to you for some closing comments. So you're on mute.
And I'm going to unmute myself. Thank you, Krista. Um, and thank you for those words. And Chad, Damian, Shelley, and Vicki, it was great to be able to hear from you. And as I said at the top, um, you know, what we're doing here at BMA um, every day is to be able to work with the Medicare Advantage community. And you're a part of it, uh, a critical part of it. And those who joined us today are, whether or not you're BMA allies, your members of um, Moving Health Home, um, and other partners um, with each of those organizations. And I know we're all committed to everything that we're focused on today, which is trying to work with seniors to be able to get the care that they want at home and deserve at home. And I appreciate Krista focusing on both the priorities, but also the barriers that we've discussed. And, you know, ironically, we just had a supplemental benefits convening last month that Damien was a part of. And this is just interesting to be able to have this follow-up conversation um, when we talk about the benefits and so many of them are benefits that these seniors deserve so they can be able to get this kind of care at home. Um, and lots of follow-up from this, just hearing from Vicki on the point of data. We just had a conversation with CMS this morning about data and it's in this area. Um, so just look forward to staying in conversations with um, all of you. And just Krista, thanks so much for all that you're doing um, in this space um, and look forward to staying in touch with all of you guys.